Almost 200 years ago, a young British Christian who was trained in theology set off on a voyage around the world. When he left England, he did not doubt the literal truth of the Bible. In fact, during the trip he quoted the Word of God as a moral authority. But he returned with questions. During the next 20 years, Charles Darwin assembled the vast array of detailed observations that he had made as the ship's naturalist into a scientific theory that rocked the world. It also rocked his own Anglican Christianity. Toward the end of his life, he made a confession. I had no intent to write atheistically, but I own that I cannot see as plainly as others do, and as I should wish to do, evidence of design and beneficence on all sides of us. There seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created Ichneumonidae, a parasitic wasp, with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, or that a cat should play with mice. One of Darwin's modern successors, Richard Dawkins, has put the point even more forcefully. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Dawkins' statement may seem harsh, and yet the claim he makes is modest. The universe we observe has the properties we would expect based simply on natural processes that we are able to identify. He makes no claims about what, if anything, lies beyond the realm of our observations. Careful, repeated observations of the natural world, however meticulous, will never allow us to say whether there is another realm beyond the reach of our senses and our ability to process information but they do allow us to understand the intricacies of the natural order, ourselves included, and they allow us to examine our God concepts in light of what we know about ourselves. What would we expect human God concepts to be like if they were simply a product of evolved human minds? Rather like the ones we have. Pascal Boyer's book, Religion Explained, outlines many ways in which our minds are not blank slates. Efficiencies are built in, in the form of default assumptions and ontological categories that function in some ways like pre-labeled filing systems. We force our life experiences into the categories available to us, and one way we do this is to interpret the world in humanoid terms. We humans are a species of social information specialists. Knowledge is our currency, and most of the knowledge we need to survive or even thrive in this world comes from other humans. It is collective, cultural evolution, rather than biological evolution alone, that has let us live long and prosper, outsmart nature's balance, and populate a whole planet. Our minds reflect our niche, Specialized systems in the brain are fine-tuned for processing information from and about other humans. One such system gives us the ability to represent the minds of other persons in our own mind. Daniel Dennett discusses this ability in his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. As he points out, if we couldn't anticipate the effects of our actions, then we basically would have to learn everything by trial and error. How much better it is to be able to represent the external environment in our brains and then run simulations. We send teenagers to driving schools so they can learn on simulators where they don't have to put real cars at risk or squander the 16 years we have put into raising them. Simulations have survival value. Consequently, Natural selection has pushed in the direction of more sophisticated simulators. The human mind has particularly sophisticated social simulators. Rather than blurting, when are you expecting? We can anticipate how a weight-conscious woman will feel if in fact she isn't pregnant. 
But in order to do so, we have to be able to represent other human minds, real, potential minds, and even imaginary minds, inside our own. Children assign names, identities, and, yes, emotions to objects that are clearly, objectively inanimate. It helps if the object is stuffed with spun polyester and covered with synthetic fur, but really almost anything will do. When my daughters were young, we traveled to visit a friend in Eastern Europe. The girls were utterly disinterested in long adult conversations over beer and well-boiled cabbage with beef. At any restaurant, they simply would sit down and pick up their forks and spoons, which had been assigned names and identities, and continue a game in which these stainless steel characters inhabited a world peopled by empty bottles, cups, and pepper shakers. The cutlery game lasted only as long as the trip, but a shabby stuffed whale comforted one of the girls for almost 10 years. Adults don't assign roles to silverware, though we certainly can, and we don't usually have transitional objects like special blankets or shabby stuffed whales. But we do give names to ships and hurricanes and then talk as if they had preferences and intentions. We become more protective of animals if we give them human nicknames. We unwittingly breed canines to look more like big-eyed baby humans by preferentially nurturing the ones that look more like us. We spend time trying to cajole favors out of tree spirits and ancestors and gods. Adults who shed traditional religion may simply move on to the next level of still anthropomorphic, still self-focused, abstraction. Some talk as if the universe itself heard our wishes and could be manipulated into fulfilling them. New Age books like The Secret, for example, encourage readers to trust that the universe cares about our wishes. It takes conscious effort for us to set aside the instinctive projection of ourselves onto the physical world, let alone anything that may lie beyond. And yet, if we care about honoring reality, we must. Author Dexter Van Dango put it this way, If humanity is to get beyond God as the ultimate human male, for good or bad, it is vital to always keep in mind our psychology, our biology, and our family relations. And it is equally essential to realize that God, if God exists, does not possess our hopes, our fears, our desires, or emotions. If God does possess anything akin to desires and emotions, these, quote, feelings are unlikely to bear any resemblance to ours. A friend of mine put it this way, I've always wondered how God can be considered omniscient and omnipotent and yet have anything resembling temporal intelligence and all that that implies, like emotions and reasoning. Without time, everything is definite and possibly indeterminate even at the same time, and the mind of God would be able to conceive of this. As these two comments illustrate, if we let ourselves contemplate the little that smart humans know about reality, then traditional Christian conceptions of divinity become transparently self-centered. It is a testament to how self-centric we are as a species that so few humans are embarrassed to assign to divinity the attributes of male alpha primates. To call biblical descriptions of God metaphors, like some modernist Christians do, does not make the situation any better. A metaphor about something as deep as the human relationship to ultimate reality needs to be deeply accurate. The center of gravity needs to be spot on even if the surface meaning is grossly simplistic. But biblical descriptions of God have this backwards. Rather than heightening the sense of an ineffable power that is compatible with the laws of physics and biology, they force divinity into a human template. Rather than evoking the humility, wonder, and delight of the unknown, they offer the comfort of false knowledge. Rather than being true to timeless, placeless, completeness. They are true to the place, time, culture, and ecosystem nexus in which they arose. 
When the writers of the Bible said God was angry or regretful or pleased, they had only a superficial idea of what these words actually meant. How could they know that these labels describe intricate, functional body systems, just like our visible appendages? Their peers didn't yet understand how two eyes create binocularity or how our muscles contract the hand, let alone the chemistry and function of emotions. They were not responsible for their ignorance. They did the best they could with the information at their disposal. They looked at the patterns in the natural world and at human society, and then, only then, made their best guesses about what lies beyond. We should do the same. <laughs>